Good evening. Hello. I'm Deborah Eisenman, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer here at the Asia Society. Welcome to tonight's special program with the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Pakistan, Minister Jalil Abbas Jalani. Each year, we host leaders from Asia and around the world during their visit to New York for the UN General Assembly meetings. All throughout the year, Asia Society provides a nonpartisan platform for the public to hear from leaders in their own words about their own countries. As a nearly 70-year-old organization, we have long sought to navigate shared futures and build bridges of understanding, a mission that has never been more important. We look forward to hearing Minister Jelani's views on Pakistan and his role in the region and world today. And we, long, we have a long history of hosting leaders from Pakistan. In the last decade, we've had ministers of foreign affairs, Hina Rabani Kar, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, Khwaja Muhammad Asif, and Prime Minister Imrad Khan. Following the minister's remarks, he'll be joined in conversation by Farwa Amr. While you would have seen their bios, I'll expound briefly here. Minister Jelani is a career diplomat with over 38 years of experience in bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. He was the Foreign Secretary of Pakistan, the top civil service role in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 12, 2012 to 2013. He's also served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the EU, and High Commissioner to Australia. And Farwa Amr is the Asia Society Policy Institute's Director of South Asia Initiatives. She previously led research and engaged in second track diplomacy on the Himalayan region for the Stimson Center. She was also director of the South Asia program at the East West Institute. During the program, should you have questions for the minister, please write them down using the index cards and pens at your seats. Raise your hands and my colleagues will come collect them from you to share with Farwa. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Asia Society's members for their support. Tonight's program and many more are made possible thanks to you. And if you're not a member, it's a great day to join. I also hope you visit our website at asiasociety.org to learn more about our events and our work. We're hosting an event tomorrow morning, for instance, with the Foreign Minister of Yemen, among other speakers and diplomats, and I hope you'll join us. Now, back to tonight's program. Tonight's event is on the record and will be posted on our website for future viewing. Before I turn the stage over to Minister Jelani, I ask that you please silence your cell phones. Thank you for that. And now please join me in welcoming the, to the stage, Minister Jelani. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, great introduction. I'm very happy to be uh, here as a matter of fact, this is the uh, repeat of my uh, uh, speeches, lectures at the uh, Asia Society. I have been coming here in the past as well. And certainly Asia Society is uh, doing a great job in, in uh, developing a good understanding between Asia and the West, particularly at a time of uh, changing and challenging uh, situations that we all have to confront with and uh, uh, this is the time when we uh, need to have a closer interaction and dialogue amongst all of us. Um, as you're all aware that um, uh, the world is uh, facing a lot of uh, transformation, a lot of challenges are being faced by almost every everyone. And these challenges are something that would require a collective response. A, 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 a kind of a united stand to deal with the kind of issues that we are confronted with. Uh, our, uh, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, uh, this is a uh, this is a world which uh, uh, which is uh, uh, you know everyone is facing challenges. Our foreign policy is also rooted in the principle of mutually beneficial cooperation, peaceful coexistence mutual respect and share economic development. Uh, these are certainly the uh, main principles of our foreign policy. And they are also, uh, they form the bedrock of our uh, ties with friends and partners around the world and translate into a proactive and positive role in the multilateral, multilateral organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan's, I'll begin uh, with uh, the most important 
and consequential relationship that we have, that is Pakistan and the United States of America relationship. Uh, it is certainly, um, in my view, the most important relationship, but at the same time, it is the least understood relationship. We have been partners since Pakistan's in independence for uh, the uh, for, for establishment of regional peace and stability. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, Pakistan has been part of almost every initiative that uh, the United States of America took either in our part of the world or in Middle East or elsewhere. And that is something that uh, uh, makes a very, very pro promising history for us to look at the future as well. I think the, uh, in the last two years or so, two important transformations have taken place in Pakistan-US relations. First, while security and defense cooperation remains an important pillar, equal emphasis is being laid by both sides to strengthen cooperation in non-security areas. And these non-security areas include uh, uh, trade and investment, climate change, energy, health, agriculture, information technology, and tech, tech sector. Second, the relationship now stands dehyphenated from all other bilateral ties. And both sides are focused on tapping the inherent potential of standalone bilateral relationship. These two transformations together provide us the ideal launching pad to enter a new era in our bilateral relationship. Over the decades, and more so in recent years, Pakistani-American community has also played a very important role in our efforts to build a strong relationship. I, uh, I have served here twice, uh, from 95 to 99, and then from 2013 to 2017, and I have seen that our community has, uh, over the years, become very, very active. They have become active in politics. They are contributing to the uh, economic growth of not only Pakistan, but also they are contributing to building a strong relationship between our two countries. And uh, the role that they have played is uh, something which is uh, very well recognized by all of us in Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, economic development lies at the top of our national priorities. To achieve, the, uh, 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 to achieve that, regional peace and stability are imperative. Peaceful neighborhood is, ho neighborhood is also essential for us to optimally utilize the potential offered by the, uh, of the regional connectivity initiatives. There are a number of uh, in regional connectivity initiatives that we have already undertaken, and there are some which are in the pipeline. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, uh, after Afghanistan itself, Pakistan has the greatest stake in an Afghanistan that is at peace within and with its regional and international partners. This objective lies at the heart of our efforts to directly engage with the Afghan interim government as well as cooperate with the international community on Afghanistan. We are hosting close to 4 million Afghan refugees in Pakistan. And this, this is something that we have been hosting for the last almost four decades. Afghan authorities and the international community, they continue to work to ensure that uh, these Afghan refugees, they, whenever the situation settles down, they go back to contribute to the economic development of, the, of their own country, which is Afghanistan. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is something that we have, uh, we feel really feel proud of because uh, the number of uh, refugees 
uh, that we have hosted over the last several decades, that is uh, perhaps unprecedented anywhere in the world. We sh also share the international community's concerns over human rights situation in Afghanistan, especially issues related to women's rights, girls' education, and women's employment. We will continue to raise these issues with the Afghan interim administration. We believe that instead of coercive measures, engaging the Afghan interim government is much more likely to deliver results. Equally important is to avert humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Uh, for that purpose, I think delinking aid from political considerations holds the key to the key in this regard. We re remain steadfast in our commitment to fight terrorism and extremism. We condemn all forms of forms and manifestation of terrorism, including state terrorism and state-sponsored violence against religious minorities. We also reject any attempt to politicize the issue of terrorism by linking it with certain countries, communities, regions, or religions. The entire global community is the victim, and we have to act together to uproot this menace. For Pakistan, the biggest concern right now is the enhanced terrorist threat from TTP and ISK and their ability to use Afghan soil for launching attacks against Pakistan. We remain closely engaged with the Afghan interim administration on this issue. While we are committed to fighting and defeating the terror terrorists, we wish to highlight the terrorist outfits trying to gain a foothold in Afghanistan should be treated as a threat to the neighborhood and the entire international community. Pakistan desires peaceful and cooperative neighborly ties with India. Unfortunately, Pakistan's positive outreach and peace overtures, including the opening of Kartarpur Corridor for visa-free visits from India from Indian Sikh community into Kartarpur. And, uh, um, um, and my predecessor's visit, visit to India for the SCO meeting have, not, have, have, uh, have been met with negativity. India's uh, illegal actions in the occupied Jammu and Kashmir and abhorrent human rights violations of innocent Kashmiris at the hand of, hands of Indian security forces have further deteriorated relations between our two countries. Worsening religious extremism in India, especially against Muslims, has further complicated the situation. In such a complex environment, objectives of regional peace and stability calls for peaceful, constructive dialogue on all outstanding issues, including Jammu and Kashmir, India's uh, belligerence and anti-Pakistan theatrics for domestic elections are taking us further away from this objective. Pakistan's relations with China are historical and anchored in strong trade and economic ties. China is Pakistan's largest trading partner and a major investor, especially in infrastructure and energy sectors. China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is a flagship project that aims at enhancing connectivity and improving infrastructure. I must underscore that Pakistan's relationship with China are not a zero-sum game and not at the expense of our relations with any other country, least of all with the United States of America with which we have, a, we have robust ties and a relationship of trust. We believe we can have close and cooperative relations with both the United States and China. Having acted as a bridge between the two countries in the past, we remain convinced that a stable and cooperative relationship between US and China 
is, uh, is uh, imperative for global growth, development, and security. Pakistan's position on the Ukrainian crisis is dictated by our belief in amicable resolution of conflicts and respect for the UN principles and territorial integrity and sovereignty. We will continue to play a constructive role to help end the war and mitigate the sufferings of the Ukrainian people. We hope that peace would prevail to allow people of both Russia and Ukraine to enjoy its dividends. We also believe that mitigating the impacts of this crisis on global food and energy security is critical and hope for early resumption of Black Sea Grain Initiative. We recognize the importance of international cooperation for global peace and prosperity. To this end, Pakistan has always been a strong advocate for multi multilateralism, believing that through dialogue and diplomacy, we can resolve conflicts, alleviate poverty, and achieve sustainable development. We have actively involved, we have been actively involved in the United Nations peacekeeping missions, contributing our troops to promote peace in conflict-ridden areas. Pakistan also considers arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation efforts as vital tools to promote the goals of peace and security at the global and regional levels. Pakistan has always advocated the need for inclusive forums for deliberations and negotiations, taking into account the security interests of all states. Pakistan has been a leading voice for the reforms of the Security Council to make it more democratic, inclusive, and accountable through reforms of its membership and improvement in its working methods. Climate change is another pressing global challenge. As last year's devastating floods bear testament, Pakistan has been on the receiving end of the worst impacts of climate change, despite being one of the lowest contributors to, glo to, to global warming. We are doing our part to combat it by investing with the help of our friends like the United States of America in reconstruction, tapping renewable, renewable energy, reforestation, and sustainable agriculture practices. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to moving our economy to macroeconomic stability. And uh, the good news is that uh, since May of this year, the macroeconomic indicators in Pakistan, they have improved significantly. CPI index, which stood at 38% in May this year, has come down to 27%. We have also embarked upon an ambitious program to, uh, to, uh, uh, to raise taxes, and the taxation system has also been reformed in recent months. And the dividends of this, these reforms will be, will be apparent very, very soon. We are also uh, 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 introduced a, a special program for investment in Pakistan, which is known as uh, uh, Special Investment Facilitation Council. The idea basically uh, behind this initiative is to cut the red tape and introduce uh, uh, a, a kind of a one window, uh, a real one window operation for investors to invest in Pakistan. The, uh, this uh, new concept has generated a lot of interest, particularly amongst the uh, GCC countries. And in the last one month, we have signed agreements with investors from uh, the Middle Eastern countries under this program, almost uh, close to about $35 billion. The investment is coming in sectors like agriculture, information technology, energy and uh, energy, mines and min minerals, and defense production. All these areas are up for investment for uh, overseas uh, investors, and the response has been extremely positive from our point of view. We are also training uh, about, we have set up new IT training centers in Pakistan, 
and we uh, hope to produce about 200,000 IT experts every year, which would, from, our, from a conservative estimate, will uh, take our IT exports from the current level of $2.5 billion to almost $10 billion in the next four to five years. So these are some, and then of course, uh, one important factor that has been introduced is the fiscal discipline. So that is something that is being seriously taken by all of us. Of course, problems are there because of the uh, uh, inflationary pressure because of the prices of uh, 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 fuel in the uh, fuel and gas in the international market, which also creates its own uh, dynamics in Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by reiterating that Pakistan to, is committed to playing its part in the Committee of Nations to address the pressing challenges of our times and realize its vision for peace, stability, justice, equity and shared prosperity. I thank you all. Thank you so much for those very insightful remarks. And, thank you. Uh, and we are glad to be in conversation with you. But before we begin, I just want to remind everyone, there will be question cards disseminated. So if you have any questions, please send them down. And uh, we'll try to take a few of them in the latter half of our event today. So without further ado. Sure. Let's just start with the U.S.-Pakistan ties. You know, you just uh, shared that it seems like the relationship is on the mend because, of course, after the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, there was a little bit of an uncertainty in the relationship, and um, there were speculations that the great power competition between the United States and China had somewhat also casted a shadow over the relationship between Pakistan and the, and the United States owing to Pakistan's own relationship with China, of course, which you've just shared that is, is a friendly one, is a strong one, is a long-term one. So my question to you, because you have this unique insight, right, being the foreign minister, but also uh, being having served as the ambassador of Pakistan to the United States, how do you see this relationship really evolving? It's a bit of a foresight-based question, it's like looking ahead, where is the road taking us? Is the reset that Islamabad that has been hoping for already there? Are we seeing a reset in the relationships already kind of manifesting? Or is it something that will require a lot more diplomatic effort from both parts? So over to you. I would love to hear your thoughts on the well, road ahead. Well, thank you so much. I, this is a question which, is, which I'm often asked in almost every forum. To, <laughs> to be very honest, I, we, we really don't see any uncertainty in this relationship. Even uh, uh, during the uh, uh, Afghanistan crisis, uh, there may be uh, times, but then long time ago, when uh, there may be differences between us how to uh, approach the situation in Afghanistan. But then I would say in the last several years, we developed convergences in the context of Afghanistan as well. And uh, uh, particularly during the withdrawal of uh, U.S. and ISAF forces from Afghanistan, the kind of help that Pakistan extended to almost every country, uh, that has been recognized uh, by everyone and deeply appreciated. Uh, as far as uh, uh, issues are concerned, I would say that uh, uh, there are always issues between friends also. There are issues between uh, uh, between uh, uh, the uh, uh, maybe the United States of America and uh, the European countries also on some of the uh, some, some aspects, but uh, you, you mentioned about China and the United States of America. We have never looked at this relationship uh, kind of uh, as a as a zero sum uh, mm -hmm. game between the. We have always played the role of a bridge between China and the United States of America. If you recall, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, in his uh, face, a very famous book on China, he had devoted full one chapter on the, on the, on the kind of role that Pakistan played in uh, developing a rapprochement between Pakistan and the United States of America. We did that in the belief that a, 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 a cooperative relationship between China and the United States of America would be uh, would be uh, would something that would 
contribute to peace and stability not only in our region but around the globe. So you know, the, and 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 we continue to play the the same kind of a role. As for the last, as I mentioned, that for the last uh, two years, our relationship is. Uh, uh, is uh, on a very solid track. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the last, uh, I would say, two years or so, a number of congressional delegations have visited Pakistan. A number of high-level visits have taken place. We have had a robust IT dialogue. We have a we, we have had a defense dialogue. We have a dialogue on you know it's a it's a it's a uh, I would say. Uh, a, a, a dialogue on uh, uh, on uh, trade and investment. So you know this this is something which is very important from our point. Absolutely, and uh, I mean I'm great. I'm I'm really thrilled to hear the optimism in the relationship. Of course, the United States has uh, an interest in a stable, secure Pakistan and a stable, secure South Asia for that matter. So we are. Um, you know, moving ahead in terms of looking at the world, like you mentioned, the transformational challenges that are there. So it's safe to say that the relationship is moving beyond the security dimension and onto a more comprehensive partnership. Absolutely. And you think that momentum will continue given that the elections are looming for Pakistan and the United States also going into elections next year. So that momentum is going to continue regardless? Well, I have absolutely no doubt that this <laughs> momentum is going to continue uh, regardless because in Pakistan there is a national consensus in building a strong relationship between Pakistan and the United States of America irrespective of, uh, of, irrespective of any political party that is in power. Uh, it is uh, certainly seen as a relationship which is of mutual benefit. Uh, we both need each other. And uh, we, 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 uh, you will see that uh, uh, in the coming months and year, this uh, relationship is going to be further strengthened. Brilliant. Um, thank you for that. Now, I have to move on from the United States to China sure. now. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, China, of course, is a, is a topic hotter than a Sichuan pepper in most parts of the world today. <laughs> um, but for Pakistan, fortunately, and at least rhetorically, mm. it's been a very joyous relationship. Long-term partner, as you pointed out, economic partner uh, through the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative. I believe Pakistan is attending the Belt and Road Forum next month. Yes, we are attending. So, uh, so that will, op I mean, we'll be looking forward for the uh, to the outcomes of that. Um, and what I was hearing while you were, you know, in your address that. You do believe that CPEC is uh, going to be providing Pakistan all these new avenues and economic sort of push that it needs. Mm -hmm. So are we to believe that the notion of game changer is still holding true? Absolutely. You know, if you look at the situation that we had before we entered into this arrangement, incidentally, uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is a project that was signed by me in, on, in Islamabad <laughs> on in May of 2013. And I take a, a lot of pride because I was part of the negotiations and I also signed this agreement in Islamabad. I think obviously it is a game, game changer for the simple reason that we see this China-Pakistan economic corridor in the, in the context of uh, overcoming energy shortages in Pakistan. We see this in the context of infrastructure development. We see this in the context of employment generation because and also China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has been transformational in many, many respects. We, uh, the kind of uh, road network that has been built following the signing of this agreement, that is again, um, it is uh, probably Pakistan in terms of infrastructure development would be much ahead of many of our uh, neighboring countries. Uh, similarly, uh, the development of ports and uh, airports which are also part of this initiative, is uh, something that is going to uh, bring about a lot of economic dividends to the country. In the next phase, incidentally, uh, we are going to focus on agriculture because that is the, that is the uh, next sort of uh, arrangement. And also upgradation of railways uh, in Pakistan. There are many other areas, for, uh, for instance, technology is another aspect of China-Pakistan economic corridor that we are going to focus on. That's uh, 
That's all great to hear. And I think now moving on from all these bilateral dynamics mm -hmm. that we've discussed, I have to ask a regional question because mm -hmm. you're also a South Asia expert. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've mentioned, right, in, in, in your address that Pakistan is interested in a safe, secure, mm -hmm. stable yes. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, South Asia, dynamic region, fast space, uh, it's got a burgeoning youth population, of a lot of potential, but unfortunately it remains highly disintegrated because mm -hmm. of the deep rooted mistrust between its member countries. Mm -hmm. And of course, India and Pakistan is a part of this puzzle, mm -hmm. a key part of this puzzle. But there are, and then there are challenges, which of course, you know, we don't have to go into an elaboration for. Um, but there are merits to co cooperation and collaboration, mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. talked about, you know, whether you talk, discuss climate change, whether you discuss water security or pandemic or trade mm -hmm. and whatnot. There is definitely a lot that South Asian countries can achieve by mm -hmm. cooperating. And we saw that during the heydays mm -hmm. of SARC, uh, mm -hmm. which you were also involved mm -hmm. in. Um, See, and that's why I feel like it's great talking to you because we can cover so much. Um, but also, um, in this waters treaty, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of what mm -hmm. uh, India and Pakistan are going through, mm -hmm. that treaty remains in place to show that uh, an agreement, mm -hmm. a mutually beneficial agreement, a signed agreement can do wonders in keeping some dialogue alive. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, and um, I would really would like to get your thoughts on, mm -hmm. Beyond India, of course, is one that like you would you said you Pakistan has made outreach. Mm -hmm. But what about the other South Asian neighbors? Mm -hmm. How is Pakistan planning to work with other neighboring countries on shared challenges, um, which are of equal importance to all of these countries? And what role mm -hmm. does Pakistan envision for itself mm -hmm. in ensuring regional peace, security, and stability? Well, um, as far as the South Asian, other South Asian countries are concerned, uh, Pakistan has excellent relations with all the South Asian countries, whether it's uh, Bangladesh, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether Afghanistan. Afghanistan, it's reasonably good. It's a new setup. We uh, do understand the limit, limitations that uh, the Afghan interim government, they face limitation in the context of their security, the overall, the economic outlook. But, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, there is a kind of a symbiotic relationship that exists between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The people of Afghanistan would always look towards Pakistan whenever challenged, uh, you know, facing, whenever they are faced with, it, with any challenge from any, any quarters. So, and that's, that's the reason that uh, we have these four million, more than four million Afghan refugees present in Pakistan because of the cultural affinity because of other things. And I, I personally feel that uh, the kind of relationship that we have with Afghanistan, this is uh, a relationship which is uh, uh, irreplaceable. There is no other relationship that can match this relationship. Similarly, uh, with other countries like Sri Lanka, if you, there is a lot of goodwill for Pakistan in Sri Lanka, whether it's Nepal, Nepal again we have Unfortunately, you mentioned about SARC. SARC has also become a victim of Pakistan-India rivalry, which is going on for the last many, many years. Uh, if you ask me, how do we sort of fix the situation? I think, uh, I personally feel that in case we are able to resolve issues between India and Pakistan, uh, certainly we can also uh, revive the SARC process. All the SARC countries would be integrated. We can also part of this regional connectivity projects. But then how do we bring about peace between India and Pakistan? That's the question that I'm sure would be in the, the, the uh, you know, uh, the top of all of you sitting here. In my view, having dealt with Pakistan-India relations for a long time in my diplomatic career, I feel that uh, it requires, uh, number one, statesmanship, courage, and an ability to take bold decisions by the leadership. And this is something that was demonstrated by the, uh, by the leadership in, uh, in 2003 when we both decided to pursue a peace process between our two countries. Uh, I remember that uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee, during his visit to uh, the Indian occupied Kashmir made a very important statement. He said that we would like to resolve issues and disputes with Pakistan 
And then he said that we would like to resolve, and this is recorded, this is, I'm quoting him, his exact words. And he said that we would, we would like to resolve the Kashmir dispute in accordance with insaniyat, which is humanity, in accordance with jamhuriyat, which is democracy, dem according to the democratic principles, and according to Kashmiriyat, which is according to, you know, in accordance with the Kashmiri aspirations. So that basically uh, laid the uh, foundation of this peace process that we, fo we followed. So that basically shows that in case the leadership demonstrates a degree of statesmanship, courage, and boldness, we can certainly resolve the issues. Secondly, I think if, uh, if there is, in the context of India and Pakistan, and for that matter, any other country in the world, it is equally important that all the political parties, they should be on board because uh, there has to be a national consensus in support of the peace process. And third, of course, is the media. Media has to play a very important role. And uh, fourth is the role of the international community. So <clears throat> all these factors, they were um, in place when we followed this peace process and we made a, a lot of good progress at that time. So I think the, the issues are resolvable. We um, have good relations with, and I, I think in case India and Pakistan, they can, uh, if, they, if they are able to resolve their dis disputes and differences, probably there will be, it will open up many opportunities for all of us in South Asia. SARC can be revived. And SARC, uh, in my view, was a very, very important uh, uh, organization which made uh, a tremendous uh, kind of uh, uh, developments in, the, in a very short period, uh, including the establishment of food security, and establishment of a bank, health sector, and almost every section, you know, sector of the society. That's. Um that's good to hear. And I think what you shared about bold decisions, mm -hmm. I think that's where the, the key and is. And I'm not sure that if that, that is the situation <laughs> now. <laughs> because I think but leaders <laughs> taking bold decisions, leaders mm -hmm. taking the first step and not being afraid of showing that willingness, political mm -hmm. will at the end of the day, yes, is at the heart of uh, any change that you would want to see, in whether it's in terms of you know, leading the way towards a more secure, sustainable, uh, region, national, on a national level or local level, I think it stands true for all of these. Mm -hmm. um, I have one other question, but just a reminder again: if you have questions, please pass it on to um, uh, to my colleagues, and then they they can take your questions and bring them here to me, so that we can answer a few of those. Um, your question cards, please. So while that process is in there, we'll have one more question for you. Um, from me, I'm using all my chair privileges to, mm -hmm. to keep the conversation going. We are here on the sidelines of the UNGA. So we have to you know, take, take this moment into account. The United Nations has, it, it offers a great platform. The world converges here year after year, but particularly for the developing world. And Pakistan being, you know, going through this economic volatility, being extremely climate vulnerable, along with other you know, members of the developing world, could really find this platform uh, full of opportunities to get backing for some of the priorities that these countries from the global south are trying to bring to the table. Um, last year, the UNGA passed a draft resolution in solidarity with the Pakistan floods as well. So there is definitely um, a, a commitment from, from the United Nations and other multilateral forums. So for the benefit of our audience here, and I am, I've been following you on Twitter, so I know you've already started your meetings and meeting uh, leaders on, on the sidelines. But how does Pakistan, um, well, looks to leverage the potential of the UNGA and other such multilateral forums for the benefit of, say, ramping up climate action, building sustainable development goals, uh, and other, well, traditional security challenges? Well, you know, uh, these are all very important issues, and uh, certainly uh, UNGA uh, provides us a platform to interact with a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, leaders from all parts, you know, all over the world. Climate change, 
uh, I think the, this is a very, very important um, subject for us for the simple reason that we are the worst affected uh, because of the negative impact of this climate change. Um, the kind of floods that we have seen, because the, you know, as you know that the floods that uh, 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 we encountered last year uh, affected 30 million people in Pakistan. Uh, it destroyed crops, you know, uh, in millions of acres of land. Uh, a lot of houses, they were destroyed. Schools were destroyed. And certainly, uh, it would require enormous resources to rebuild or to provide sustenance to those people who got affected because of the massive floods. We are very active, although we uh, are the least contributor to uh, green, you know, the, the, these emissions. But then we are the worst affected. So we played a very important role in COP27, as you uh, are aware, uh, in terms of uh, uh, bringing about a consensus on loss and damage and also climate finance. But the important thing is that uh, we need to re-energize the uh, international community in the actual implementation of the, of the, uh, uh, the understanding that had been developed either in COP27 or in the donors conference that was held in Geneva. Uh, in last last year, but sorry, beginning of this year. Uh, the, the, I think the uh, there is another conference going to be uh, to be held um, very soon. I think uh, uh, early next week. Uh, it is going to be on climate finance, where the secretary general is going to give uh, a whole sort of uh, present a report about. Uh, the uh, the real actions which had been taken following the donors conference that was held in Geneva beginning of this year. We are also preparing for the next uh, uh, climate uh, conference, COP28, which is going mm -hmm. to take place in in um, UAE. And last, like uh, uh, last year in COP27, we will certainly play a very, very active role in that also. That's great to hear, Minister. Um, I'm going to now, being cognizant of our time left, uh, move to some of the questions from the audience. Um, very quickly, um, we just had an announcement of an India, Middle East, Europe corridor at the G20 Leaders Summit, mm -hmm. which is seemingly a challenge to BRI. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we, uh, well good luck for, uh, <laughs> for these countries because uh, we are not part of that initiative. Uh, but then um, we have seen that um, uh, we are basically reaping the benefits of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is the flagship ship uh, project of BRI. Uh, these uh, initiatives uh, uh, are very good, but then um, uh, certainly there are certain uh, controversies. It, it has generated controversies as well, which uh, I think everybody is well aware of with regard to this project. So there's another um, CPEC-related question, mm -hmm. but one that is important for climate change and sustainable development, I guess, is China's moved from a coal fossil fuel-based economy to a renewable energy economy, including expanding transportation systems that are electric and zero emission. Will these new technologies be part of CPEC as well? Well, certainly, you know, the uh, kind of projects that we have pursued, particularly on the, um, uh, so mostly they relate to um, um, uh, the uh, wind power solar system, which is, uh, which is, which are certainly, uh, which do not contribute anything to the uh, global emissions. Uh, even the coal power project, one project that was established under China-Pakistan economic corridor, that is also uh, in accordance with the, uh, with the international standards with uh, almost zero emission. So this is this lighthearted question, so mm -hmm. we'll take it. Uh, in addition to policy issues, mm -hmm. culture, whether it's music or art, they're all important to better and deepen the understanding um, could you speak to the idea of cultural diplomacy and how that can help Pakistan and South Asia? Well, certainly this is an important area. Uh, I think we are uh, uh, 
um, uh, you know, in our interaction with uh, most of the countries, this, is, uh, this forms an important part of our interaction. Whether it's cultural diplomacy, art and culture, you mentioned about the uh, Buddhist exhibition that was right. that uh, traveled to the United States of America. That is also part of our uh, cultural diplomacy. And this uh, Gandhara art art exhibition, this is not only in the United States of America that is that was exhibited, but also around the globe. And it is one of the most important uh, ventures that we have undertaken. In whether it's Japan, whether it's Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, Middle East, and these are all. And then plus art and music. Our music is certainly, uh, the Kavali, you know, this Kavali is getting very popular, not only in uh, the United States of America, but the entire uh, Europe. Uh, Rahat, Ali Fateh, Rahat Fateh Ali Khan <laughs> remains the most uh, uh, popular uh, singer uh, and liked uh, equally by the South Asians as well as uh, the Western audience. Well, um, questions and mentions uh, that you know, we talked about U.S.-Pakistan relations um, and Pakistan being a part of every major U.S. initiative, but Pakistan is not a part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, how should the U.S. think differently about Pakistan in the broader context of its Indo-Pacific approach, especially given um, how it is increasingly defined by a sense of rivalry with China? Well, you see, the, um, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, we certainly have been part of every initiative. Uh, but then uh, the way Indo-Pacific strategy is uh, being looked at by many of the Asia-Pacific countries, in, many in Asia as well, even in South Asia, that is entirely different from uh, the other, uh, from the uh, Western the way the, a, 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 you know, other countries would look at. Um, if the concept uh, of Indo-Pacific strategy, basically the, the idea behind the strategy is uh, the containment of one country, then obviously, and that is how most of the countries in the Asia-Pacific would, uh, would look at. Then obviously Pakistan has already uh, made it very clear that Pakistan will not become part of any bloc politics because it, uh, according to a perception, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, will, it, it would certainly constitute a move towards that kind of a phenomena. So Pakistan certainly would not become any, any part of that. Uh, it's safe politics. to say we'll not ha see Pakistan coming up with an Indo-Pacific outlook. Or an approach. Well, if the uh, if uh, uh, the, there is some kind of a cooperative arrangement as part of Indo-Pacific strategy, strategy, Pakistan certainly will will okay. become part of it. But if the uh, idea is to to uh, trigger some kind of a competition between two power centers, then obviously Pakistan will not become a part of it. So going back to what you had said, as long mm -hmm. as it's mutually beneficial, it's in the interests of the in country the and the region. In the of the country and the region, then certainly. Then we'll certainly. We, we're close to our wrap up, so, but I have two very important questions for you. Mm -hmm. One is, what is one thing you would like for everyone to know about Pakistan? Um, just you know, for everyone here and everyone who will be tuning in to the recording later. Mm -hmm. And the second one, more importantly, mm -hmm. what keeps you up at night being a top diplomat <laughs> in a country like Pakistan? <laughs> Well, you know, the, uh, uh, when I was taking up this position or previously as uh, a foreign secretary, uh, one of my colleagues who is sitting here, he made a very interesting remark. He said that you are get, getting into a situation whereby uh, you would be thinking all the time, whether, you know, whether you're sleeping, whether you're eating, whether you're walking, or even while you're talking to somebody. Uh, so this is exactly the kind of situation that I am in. Uh, while you were sort of you were talking to me, I was also thinking of my next meeting <laughs> that is going to take place in the next half an hour and the kind of issue that I'm going to uh, discuss in that meeting. Uh, what I would like everybody to, uh, to uh, do, I, uh, come and visit us in Pakistan. It's a very exciting place to be. Uh, it offers you... Uh, 
uh, it, uh, you know, culturally, it's a very rich country. It's, uh, it's very scenic. Uh, our, uh, uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, ours is, a, ours is more than 5,000 years old uh, history. Uh, we, are, uh, 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 we are kind of the inheritors of a very rich civilization, Gandhara and uh, Buddhist civilization. Ours is a country which, uh, which, which uh, where uh, uh, one very, very important uh, religion was born, and I was. I'm talking about Hinduism. Uh, one re re religion, imp very very uh, important religion, was came into Pakistan uh, f f f f f from the Arab world, which is Islam. And one religion, a uh, very very important religion, which flourished uh, in Pakistan, that is the Buddhist uh, religion. And we have. Uh, probably the oldest university in the world in Texala, which is, uh, which is just, uh, which is about 5,000 years old university. Just imagine that 5,000 years old, that was uh, the center of Buddhist civilization, and you see uh, the uh, ruins of that civilization even now. Well, thank you so much, Minister, for your time. It was great speaking with you. And even though you were thinking while we were talking, <laughs> you, you ensured that it came across as we had your full attention. Thank you so, so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you for so being much. a great sport. Thank you so and much. And everyone, thank you for joining us. Please do stay tuned um, with Asia Society events uh, and with our Asia Society policy work. And we would love to see you again here in the building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.